Welcome back, I'm Matt Chemist, and today we have important papers in organic synthesis featuring some hypervalent iodonium reagents. To give you an overview of some of the different hypervalent iodine reagents that exist, I've prepared a list here just kind of showcasing all the different possibilities of what you might see in organic synthesis. Note that this isn't comprehensive, but this will give you a snapshot of some of the main hypervalent iodine reagents that can be used in organic synthesis. Iodoniums have some useful reactivity, although depending on the reagent that you're using, you might end up seeing some side reactions that are undesired, since highly reactive reagents have multiple modes of reactivity. So I'm not going to be discussing all of the reagents that I showed in the previous slide, but I will give you a snapshot of some of the methodologies that I think are pretty useful and worth knowing about. Let's start with the aerylation of thioethers. If you take a diaryl iodonium, such as this diaryl iodonium hexafluorophosphate, it's possible to aerylate an aryl thioether to get the corresponding sulfonium. This reactivity is accelerated by the presence of metal catalysts such as copper benzoate, as is shown here. And the resulting sulfonium, if it contains an alpha proton, can be deprotonated to prepare the corresponding sulfonium illid. These illids can engage in a cori tchaikovsky reaction, for instance, with aldehydes, imines, or even Michael acceptors, affording epoxides, aziridines, and cyclopropanes, respectively. Another reagent that you can do with diaryl iodoniums is the beta aerylation of ketones in the presence of palladium and this ligand. Here you can see that a wide range of different functional groups and ketones were tolerated, enabling the installation of beta aryl groups. Now sometimes iodoniums instead can be transmetallated. So here's a case where Stang's reagent, which is the corresponding cyanoiodonium reagent, is able to transmetallate with this tributyl tin uracil derivative, preparing the corresponding vinyl phenyl iodonium triflate. This could then be engaged in subsequent chemistry to install new functional groups at the alpha position. Another case of aryl iodonium reactivity that you quite often see in organic synthesis is the de-aromatization of phenols. In the presence of an alcohol such as methanol, this methoxy group can be added para to the phenol, simultaneously de-aromatizing the phenol to this bis Michael acceptor, which can then engage in more traditional organic chemistry. Alternatively, if the para position isn't substituted, two methoxy groups can be added, and then this could even be deprotected to afford the corresponding benzoquinone. Alternatively, since this is a monoprotected ketal, you could do chemistry with that ketone still prior to unmasking the other ketone. So this is often applied in total syntheses. This reagent not only de-aromatizes phenols, but it's possible to add methoxy groups into indoles in the three position. This type of reactivity also works for intramolecular cyclizations, where in this case, an acetate group is added to the three position, enabling the two position for nucleophilic attack by the substituted tryptamine derivative, forming this aminal, which was then taken forward in this total synthesis. I'm sure glad I didn't have to make this. An intramolecular disulfide on this sort of motif looks like it would be an absolute pain to synthesize. Another possibility with the reagent BABE is to transmetallate vinyl zirconium reagents, where the zirconium is instead replaced with an aryl iodonium. This then allows you to have new modes of reactivity besides what would be possible with the zirconium reagent, which is a derivative of Schwartz reagent. Normally these are prepared through the addition of hydro-Schwartz reagent to the corresponding alkyne, which I've discussed in a previous important papers. Alternatively, if you instead have a vinyl boronate, instead of getting transmetallation of the iodine, you're instead afforded with the cis vinyl acetate, which could then be deprotected to afford the corresponding aldehyde. So this is a useful method, and depending on the modes of reactivity that you're looking to achieve, you could add either the hydro-Schwartz reagent to an alkyne to get the corresponding vinyl zirconium, or alternatively, you could hydroborate that alkyne to get the corresponding boronate, which would then allow you to get the acetate. So this is a way to take an alkyne and directly get an aldehyde from it over two steps. Now I briefly wanted to mention the synthesis of iodonium illids. So if you take a compound with an active methylene position, such as this dimethylmalonate, when you treat this with BABE, the elimination of two equivalents of acetic acid occurs, and you get an iodonium illid. These iodonium illids have been used in all sorts of chemistry, and one example of that is in the synthesis of alpha carboxylic acids. So here in the case of this alkyne containing carboxylic acid, 
the iodonium ilid is displaced, enabling hydrocarboxylation, affording this interesting product. This would be a way to install an alpha oxygen, which would be different than some of the alternative approaches, which I'll be discussing in an upcoming video. Some other uses of iodonium ilids are shown here, where several different analogs were prepared from the corresponding methylene compounds, and then under photochemical condition, these pseudocarbenes were able to be added to the corresponding alkenes. In reality, this is more like a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition, followed by the elimination of iodobenzene, affording these cyclopropanes. This sort of methodology has also been reported with rhodium and copper, but this is a metal-free version, which I thought was worth noting. As I stated before, this isn't quite a carbene, but a pseudocarbene, as we undergo a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition. This then enables the formation of an iodonium cyclobutane, which then eliminates iodobenzene under photochemical conditions, affording the corresponding cyclopropane. Now, if you were to take one of these ilids and treat them with an aldehyde in the presence of copper, you would get a similar reaction to the cory tchaikovsky reaction, where an epoxide would be formed. Although, you don't just have to use copper, because other metals have also been reported. Another cool thing that you can do with BABE is, upon treatment with an amine such as tosyl amide, it's possible to get the corresponding I double bond N reagent. You can think of this as a nitrine precursor, sort of like if you have a carbene, which is a carbon with two unpaired electrons, you could have a nitrogen with two unpaired electrons. And nitrines tend to be quite reactive. In this case, rather than a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition, we have a 2 plus 1 cycloaddition, where the electron pair of the sulfur is able to attack the I double N bond. And then through the elimination of iodobenzene, we have the transfer forming this S double bond N reagent. These are often useful for preparing specialized reagents, or alternatively, in the synthesis of ligands. There's also been reports of more traditional nitrine-like behavior through the use of transition metal coupling, such as in the use of manganese. Here's one case where azeridination of styrenes was reported, and another case is shown here where allylic amination was demonstrated. Another class of iodoniums worth knowing about is alkynyl iodoniums. Now the cool thing about these is you can kind of treat them like an alkyne plus reagent. So when you have an active methylene position, such as in these cases shown here, we have an enolate-like species which is able to attack the iodine and then undergo reductive elimination, affording the corresponding alpha alkynylated species. This would be a way to introduce an alkyne in a really convenient matter that may be challenging to otherwise do. So if you're ever looking to install an alkyne in an alpha position, don't forget to consider alkynyl iodoniums, as often these are quite easy to prepare just through the treatment of terminal alkynes with iodosyl benzene in the presence of a strong acid. Here's an example of a transformation of an alkynyl iodonium to the corresponding tosylate, just through treatment with a catalytic amount of copper triflate. Alternatively, you can treat this with sodium benzoate to get the corresponding alkynyl benzoates, or even with the corresponding sodium phosphonate to get the corresponding alkynyl phosphonates. So it's possible to form CO bonds on alkynyl iodoniums through treatment with nucleophilic oxygen-containing nucleophiles. Alternatively, if you're looking to add some functionality to the beta position of the alkyne, it's possible to treat them with TMS azide or alternatively sodium azide. And upon workup in the first case, we get hydroazidation while still retaining the iodonium. So now we have a vinyl iodonium. In the second and third cases, when we have a good nucleophile such as methanol or triethylsilane, we instead undergo azidation, hydrogenation, and then displacement of the iodonium either by the methoxy group or by the triethylsilyl group, enabling a way to get functional group rich alkenes. If you were to take an alkyne which has been functionalized in both positions with iodoniums, these can then be treated with a wide range of nucleophiles to get different sorts of products. In the first case, by treatment with sodium thiophenylate, it's possible to displace both of the iodoniums, affording this bis thioether substituted alkyne. You could then do Diels Alder type chemistry with this to get interesting sorts of substituted products. Alternatively, you could functionalize this further and then have your thioaryl groups retained. In this case, lithium phenoxide was used to get the bis phenoxy ether of acetylene. If instead triphenylphosphine is used, we'll get this bis triphenylphosphonium species 83. 
However, if only one equivalent of triphenylphosphine is used, it's possible to get the selective displacement of only one of the iodoniums while retaining the other. So this might be a useful way to have some diverse reactivity for your synthesis. In fact, it's even possible to take a di-ion bis-iodonium, treat this with sodium thiophenylate, and get the bis-thioether 85, which looks pretty unstable if you ask me. If you were to take one of these alkynyl iodoniums and treat them with a lithiated furan or thiophene species, instead of getting transfer of the alkyne like you might expect, you'll instead encounter transmetallation. So if you're looking to get a heteroaryl iodonium, taking a lithiated species and transmetallating might be a good way to accomplish that. Such as if you're trying to transfer this furan group or this thiophene group in some sort of cross-coupling reaction or heteroarylation. In the case of vinyl iodoniums, there's many different ways to functionalize them. It's possible to take Cori Posner reagents, also known as Whiteside House reagents, and substitute that iodonium with some carbon containing nucleophile. If you instead treat this with a cyanocuprate, it's possible to displace that iodonium with a nitrile, giving you an acrylonitrile derivative. When treated with copper sulfate and sodium nitrite, you'll instead form a nitrovinyl compound which is another useful strategy to install nitro groups, which you don't see featured very often. As with the alkynyl iodoniums, it's possible to use sodium thiophenylate to get the corresponding phenyl thiovinyl ether. Another example with copper halides and potassium halides is for the synthesis of vinyl halides, specifically vinyl iodides, bromides, and chlorides. Similar to what we showed earlier with alkynyl iodoniums, when vinyl iodoniums are treated with a good active methylene compound, will instead have carbon-carbon bond forming reactions. So this is another good strategy to form carbon-carbon bonds. Finally, in the presence of an alcohol and carbon monoxide with a palladium catalyst, it's possible to add a carbonyl group as well as your alkoxy group to afford the corresponding ester. So this one reagent is able to prepare a whole suite of different products depending on what it's treated with. So iodonium species are important to know about due to their wide applicability and the diverse range of products that can be prepared upon treatment with different nucleophiles under different sets of conditions. Do you have bigger synthetic problems? Do you have synthetic challenges which would benefit from some attention from a skilled synthetic chemist? Maybe you're working with a CRO or a synthesis on demand company who's running into some roadblocks, or maybe you're trying to set up your own synthesis in-house. If you're looking for some consulting services, I'm still accepting a few more clients for the 2025 year. If you'd like to get in touch, my email is down below. Alternatively, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.